Yep. Welcome back. It is a brand new episode of Liam Picks Fights Presents Bets and Banter. And of course, we're talking about UFC Vegas 90. It's a rematch. We're talking about Brendan Allen and Chris Curtis. They'll do it again. This time, it's going down in the main event, 185 pounds, five-round fight. And Brendan Allen's got a lot of momentum in the division. But could it all be halted on short notice again by Chris Curtis? We'll have to find out on Saturday night. But we got a great guest to break it all down with us once again. He's back in the building. You know him. You love him. You were asking for him last week. Just win, baby. Rich, how are you feeling, my brother? Feeling good, bro. Good to be back and all that. Um, yeah, it's the Easter holidays, isn't it? Yeah. So the kids are off school. I, I'm away um, doing grown-up things. But yeah, I've got time for the pod. So um, let's get into it, man. Yeah, and honestly, I think every fight fan and every uh, you know gambler is starting to look ahead because we got a great fight card at UFC 300. But in the meantime, let's see if we can exploit the market one more time. Uh, with this fight card and we'll start like we always do at the bottom of the card and work our way on up we got melissa mullins taking on nora cornole uh would you like to start us off or you want me to go first rich i don't mind man i got a little bit of something to say for each each bout um so yeah i like mullins dixon whatever name she's using these days uh, i mentioned on my little breakdown that she's like a coventry girl um, they're notoriously a bit rough um, from them ends. And I like that, man. I think it's good. Like, she's got good tenacity, um, as you'd say. And I think that's good for women's MMA. Um, you know, when the going gets tough, she definitely doesn't get going. Seen that on the regional scene against that Russian chick who fought last week. Um, you know, she was getting pieced up on the feet, and then she was able to get a takedown and, um, you know, change the course of that fight. But in this fight... I think she rolls. I think submission's a good look. Um, people are starting to jump on it, though, so you better hurry up. This um, Frenchy Cornell girl, we've seen her in a debut in France. She lost to Edwards, in my opinion. No major robbery, but she shouldn't have won that fight. Um, if you're getting, you know, khabibed by Edwards, you know, you've got problems in the grappling. I think them problems are still there. Dixon can exploit it and get her submission, man. Um, at a wide number. She's been doing some jiu-jitsu outside of the UFC. And, um, yeah, women's MMA, man. Um, they like, like to choke each other out. So, yeah, I like the submission. That's all I'm going to be targeting. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Mullins is probably going to get the job done in this fight. Uh, I thought Cornole was live in her last fight because, you know, I wrote up in my article, I thought Jocelyn Edwards was probably going to win the fight in round three or, or by split decision. But I acknowledged, I was like, there's a chance that the, they just give it to her because she's French and, you know, she does some damage when the fight's on the feet. Like you, you can make a case for her almost in all of her fights. She's pretty aggressive. Um, but what I think is ultimately her undoing is the lack of grappling chops. And also she's not on her home base, right? She's got to go to Vegas this time. And I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for her. Um, so this for me is a fight where I do expect Mullins to probably finish this fight. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a sub or not. I do think um, the sub is more, uh, you know, value. And I, I, I just think that she's very aggressive with her ground and pound as well. Um, and I just think positionally, she's probably going to be screwed on the mat. So that's the way I feel about this one. I'll leave it at that because the props haven't widely opened here. Um, but yeah, that I, I agree with your thoughts uh, pretty summarily there. And that's a fight that I was planning on betting. But they, of course, have waited and waited to open props for this fight. So um, we'll see how it goes. Next up, my man, we got Dylan, the mindless Hulk, Budka, taking on C. Almeida. And this is a fight where Cesar Almeida, I called him winning on the contender series as a dog. Um, you know, I just thought he's got a lot of experience. If you watch his kickboxing bouts, I know this will sound silly, but you could tell that he can move in the clinch. You know, like some guys are just not good clinch operators. They don't have those skills. And he does have them. And you see that in the Pereira fight, um, you know, for example. So I, I think of Almeida as a guy who's fought at the highest levels of kickboxing. He's fought the world champion multiple times. And I think he's a really dangerous opponent, especially for somebody who's pretty young and, and green in their career. Uh, I watched some Budka tape earlier today. Um, I do think that he's a, a solid fighter. Um, he's got good heart. He keeps pushing. He goes for takedowns. But, you know, he's getting lit up by uh, Bakoev or whatever that guy's name was. 
um, for large portions of that fight. Uh, he landed his own shots. It wasn't to say like he didn't, you know, um, land good shots and get some takedowns, but you know, his defense does not seem very well put together on the feet. It seems like a lot of, I'm just going to come forward and try and take you down. But even some of the takedowns were just not very successful in the fights I was watching. Um, so I think he has a path to winning this fight, you know, and I understand why people would play him as an underdog here in the early markets. Um, now that the line is flipped, I, I feel like this is, you know, a minus 110 type of situation. I feel like both guys have a clear path to victory. Um, Almeida has also shown that even if you try and proactively grapple him, it's not to say that he's instantly going to just lose the fight. Um, I think he's got some answers in the grappling department. I do think he's a guy that uh, works pretty diligently on, on the one portion of his game that he knows people are going to try and target every time he steps into the octagon. So uh, I think Almeida is a, a dangerous guy and he needs to win right now. You know, he doesn't have time. Uh, Budka could easily be rebuilt if he loses in this fight. He's a young man uh, getting a lot of experience out there against high level guys, but he's lost in the past uh, when he's had these steps up in competition. And uh, I think Almeida, despite having a pretty limited record in mixed martial arts, is kind of a step up in competition. Um, so that's the way I feel about it. How do you feel, Rich? Yeah, it's a super binary fight, isn't it? Like you're going to have Budka cage pushing, trying to get the takedowns or Almeida keeping it on the feet. Uh, I don't trust either of them to implement their game, to be honest. Um, I knew coming in this week that everybody was going to reference Almeida and Alex Pereira, and that's pretty much his story, isn't it? Um, I think, if I'm right, he lost twice and he won one against Alex. Um, like, big whoop, man. I don't really care. Um, I don't think that makes um, him deserving of being in the UFC I get the UFC, you know, the short on storylines or whatever. It'd be great if, you know, he could get a win here, win his next one, and who knows, maybe fight Alex down the line. That'd be something. But don't trust him. I don't think his striking was that great from what I've seen on his Dana White Contender Series fight. Um, it's hard to gauge his grappling because he was getting taken down by that steroid freak of a Brazilian on the Dana White Contender Series. Um, so it's hard to gauge where he's at with his grappling and takedown defense. Uh, I'm sure Budka will have success early. Um, but whether he can sustain that for like three rounds, I don't know, man. I think it will get a bit, um, you know, a bit wild come mid round two. Maybe, you know, he fails on his takedowns and Almeida has some, some success. And that's why I don't want any action, man. I can imagine betting Bud Budka um, and then come mid round two, his cardio fails him or, or he can't get his grappling going and he's just cage pressing, doing nothing. Uh, and that can make for some close rounds, man. So I don't trust his side as a favorite. I don't like the price. And yeah, the price isn't good enough on Almeida for me to take the shot, man. Um, was he around plus 300 on that Dana White Contender Series fight, Almeida? I can't remember, man. I think he was like plus 200, I believe, uh, uh, from yeah. the top of my head. Um, Summit's some stupid. So yeah, no action from me. But yeah, gun to my head. Budka wins the decision, I guess, by cage pushing uh, and making it a boring fight. But yeah, no action I want to take part of. The one thing I'll add here, just as a little interesting color, is that that guy, Lucas Fernando, I actually really respected his game, uh, which I mentioned in my breakdown. I was like, this guy seems like a solid fighter. He's got skills everywhere. But I just didn't think he could overwhelm him with the grappling. And that's kind of what I felt like he needed to do. And when I'm looking at this um, record for Lucas Fernando, he lost his next fight after the Cesar Almeida fight. And it was to Bacoa. The same guy that beat Budka. So it's just like this guy, Lucas Fernando, is being dealt from the bottom of the deck. Um, but in any case, I, I do think he's a pretty quality fighter and he's never been finished in his career. So that's the other thing is I don't really hold that against Caesar. Like he's a, a young, tough kid, never been finished before. And Budka, I just think, takes a lot of chances. You know, he, he takes a lot mm -hmm. of risks and um, I feel like he could tire himself out. So a um, couple pass to a finish late. But. Do you know what's funny? I think Dana signs all these Dana White contender series people, puts them on the shelf, completely forgets about them, and he's like, fuck it, just put that one against that one, see what happens, <laughs> see if we can make make something out of one of these, make a winner out of one of them. Um, they're both mid, man. They're both trash. Dude, well, the one thing I'll just say is, like, I would get it if it was, like, this guy just fought Pereira 10 years ago and then, like, popped up out of nowhere. But in 2023, he's, like, fighting for the world title in kickboxing still. Like, he's just, like been back and forth between kickboxing and MMA. And obviously he was having more success in kickboxing, but when he realized, all right, I'm not going to beat this guy. Like I fought him twice. I can't win the world title. I tried to beat Alex. And, you know, I couldn't get over on these best guys. Now he's just trying to cash in on an MMA career. 
And I do think he has like a lot of skills to fall back on. And I pointed to a lot of examples in uh, like clips and like footage on that uh, contender series fight uh, of times where like he was implementing like guillotines and like front headlocks and stuff in kickboxing, just like forcing people's head down. Um, so I do think that he has some knowledge of grappling um, that he's going to try and, you know, keep this fight honest and on the feet for as long as he can. Uh, and I don't think that Bud is like a lights out wrestler. I do think he's got a lot of persistence though. And that's um, half the battle, as they say. Next up, we got Gene Matsumoto taking on Dan, the determined Argetta. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, man, who the fuck did uh, Dan piss off to get a line like this? Um, he should be the favorite, in my opinion. He's the one who's had UFC fights. Um, you know, he's the one not making his debut. Um, he's got age on his side where this kid's just 24 with some bullshit, um, some bullshit record. I think he's like 16 and 0. But yeah, over half his fights are against nobodies. They're just against guys like me and Liam. Um, you know, 0 and 1 guys, 0 and 0, whatever. So I don't count them. So in, in my head, he's really like 8 and 0, 6 and 0, something like that. Um, I don't think he's that great, to be honest. Um, I think Dan's the better, well, he's certainly the better wrestler. But yeah, I think he's the better fighter overall. Um, I don't even like this kid striking, man. Um, it's very predictable. It's like one, two, and he always finishes with a kick. It's very predictable, that, uh, the kick that he always finishes with. Um, I don't know. I just think Dan's going to wrestle him out, to be honest. His takedown defense isn't great. Um, we know what Dan's going to do. He's going to grind. He can do it for five rounds if he needs to. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it's the debut for this kid. I don't like that for him, um, especially being 24. And yeah, I think Dan puts it on him. Um, maybe even gets a submission, man. Um, I um, listened to someone earlier in the week and they were saying that this kid's a black belt as well. Um, I don't like to see that, especially at 24. It leads me to believe it's not a, um, a legit black belt. Fuck knows who gave it to him. Um, but yeah, I like Dan quite a bit in this one. I see the lines coming down. Um, he's like plus 125 now. Um, he opened up at a stupid number. And yeah, I'm surprised more people aren't on him, man. Um, I definitely think he can grind this kid out, win a decision or submission along the way. Yeah. For me, this is an interesting one. I thought Dan was going to beat uh, Miles Johns, and he had a lot of the success I thought he was going to have early in that fight and ended up slowing down, um, which I found a little bit disappointing, but understandable because then Miles Johns tests positive for everything under the sun right after that. I'm kidding. Um, you know, I think they only caught him for one thing, but in any case, you know, I feel like it, it told a story itself. You know, Dan looked like he was exhausted from trying to move him around. Um, when I looked at this fight, man, I think that it's an interesting one. You know, Matsumoto comes in with a lot of hype. Um, you know, obviously I don't lay chalk very often. I'm not going to do it on a debuting fighter, uh, in this case, but I did think that, you know, he has a pretty, uh, interesting build coming into this fight. Uh, very young. So he could still be like a different version of himself every time out. Um, and, the thing about the Casey Tanner fight is Casey Tanner was uh, was hurt coming into that one, or not hurt, uh, sick or something like that. He just came in and didn't really look like himself, wasn't trying to pursue the grappling as much as he normally would early in the fight. So it does lead me to think, like, Dan could come out here and finish this fight in round one, but I, I just worry that as the fight gets extended, he might get a little bit fatigued in this fight going against a young kid that could just be really bullish to keep pushing and getting back up to his feet. Um, and I, I don't think that his striking is on the same level. I do think, you know, talking about predictable striking, I think Dan's pretty predictable in his striking. Uh, oftentimes, you know, he's going to go to the boxing. He's going to go maybe to a low kick, but I think he's pretty straightforward with his aggression. So he could get timed later in this fight. If he starts to slow down, if he does too much squeezing with his hands early in the fight, but, I think that this should be a much more competitive fight than the line indicated. I did think about taking Dan, um, especially at the early prices. The lines come down pretty considerably. So that's what um, has kept me off this. You know, I think another way to potentially uh, get different to the market, I'm just going to look at the props here. I haven't looked at them fully. Fight doesn't go the distance. It's plus 180. I know you said you think he could grind out a decision. I do think that's possible as well. But I also think that we can see either one of these guys get finished in this fight. 
Um, I think Dan's a really tough guy. I don't think he's going to go away easy, but I do think he could get hit with a lot of clean shots in this fight at distance. And I think that on the other side, you know, if Dan's getting to his positions, he almost submitted Ronnie Lawrence in like 90 seconds and they didn't pay me out on the plus 170. That was the only bet I had on the card that night. I was gutted, man. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but, you know, we didn't see any answer from Ronnie Lawrence in that position. It did look like his hand was hovering. I don't know if he was going to tap or not, but he was just in a bad situation. And uh, I do think that's a really, you know, a, a credit to uh, Dan. I know Ronnie has since, you know, retired from competition, but we've seen instances of Dan going out there, taking guys down, beating them up before in the past. And so I think that in a competitive violent division, like Bantamweight plus 180 plus, uh, you know, 200 on the fight, not to go the distance does uh, kind of catch my eye. But I'll have to see how this one goes. Yeah, I'll, I'll add some stuff as well, man. Um, if you Please look at our get his career, uh, when he came in and he fought Jason, um, Jason Jackson, Damon Jackson, um, you know, that was up at 145, man. It was short notice. The metrics were against him. And um, yeah, he did all right in that fight, man. I know it's a different style matchup from fighting um, Gene here, but um yeah, I think allowances can be made for some of um, our Greta's performances. Like you said, with Mars Johns, he was on all the fucking, you know, juice going. Um, but yeah, my advice to people here would be don't bet Gene. Like, don't don't bet fight doesn't go the distance. Gene ain't finishing anyone. He's shit, man. Um, Dan's the side. And uh, yeah, I think at a high percentage, he, um, he um, gives this kid a little vet lesson, man. A welcome to the UFC for sure. Fair play. Fair play. Next up, my man, we got Cynthia Calvillo taking on Piera Rodriguez. And I think you and I both took the uh, took the old polar plunge on Cynthia Calvillo last time out against Lupi Godinez. And it was a split decision in the end that, we, you know, we had the, the plus money. Uh, you can't be too disappointed when that's the outcome. However, I have been a little bit fatigued by Cynthia Calvillo over time. I think that she has skills. I think that her skills are a lot more likely to translate to wins and finishes at 115 pounds than 125 pounds. But I just don't know that she still has the same fire uh, to, you know, compete. I hope that she does for her own sake. Uh, with the Pierre Rodriguez side, she has a couple wins, but I'll be frank, none of them blow my hair back. I don't feel compelled to bet this fight. I feel like I'm I'm happy to let this fight go by. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, I do it every time, man. I bet Calvillo and I bet her by sub. Done it in the last couple of fights. Um, I don't know what's wrong with her, man. She doesn't play to her strengths. She doesn't initiate grappling anymore. You know, when she first came into the UFC, taking these girls down and looking like a fucking a shark on the mat, man, within like a minute, you know, she was wrapping them up, um, being vicious. And now, man, she's doing what I hate most, especially in women's MMA, when you've got a girl who's amazing at grappling and they come out and they're like, oh, I'm going to test my fucking kickboxing. And they like skirt around the outside. They throw a jab every minute. Um, you know, they, they, they do some shuffles thinking they're fucking um, Sugar Ray Robertson out there. And it pisses me off, man. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably going to bet her again. I've done it the last fucking four times. I might as well. It's probably her last fight in the UFC if she loses. So, yeah, I'll probably be on Calvillo, probably be on submission again, um, and she'll probably disappoint me again. But this is a massive step down, probably the worst girl she's fought in her career in Rodriguez. Rodriguez is just mid to F, I think, to be honest, and she's terrible off her back. She sh showed that against Gillian Robertson. Um, I know Robertson's good, but she made no attempts to get back up. Um, she was content to just lay on her back and... Let Robertson work for submissions, man. So, um, yeah, if Cavillo is smart, takes her down, she can definitely sub this girl at plus 700. Um, but whether she's willing to do that or not, I don't know. Um, time will tell. Yeah, against Marina Rodriguez, she goes out there and gets a 10-8 round. Like, everything looks like it's just smooth sailing. Uh, and it's like, why Why don't you do that every round? Why don't you just take people down and, and put that body yeah. in and beat them up? Uh, it's a frustrating career to watch unfold, but hopefully she goes back to her roots here uh, and and pulls one out because otherwise, I think you're right, Rich. I think this will be the last Cynthia Calvillo fight. You know, certainly a fall from grace now fighting four fights in on a UFC prelim. 
um, that they're trying to bury their own card because it's going against WrestleMania. But in any case, we've got next up, Pedro Falcao, a short notice replacement here, taking on Victor Stryker, Hugo, friend of the show, came back and commented nice things when we called him to win on the Contender Series. So he's a friend of the show for life. But in any case, we got to try and break this down objectively. And, um, you know, I think I did the last one. So why don't you go ahead, Rich? Um, you know, we'll let you start this one off. Have you had a chance to look at this one? It's a short notice replacement. Nah, not really, man. I don't like Hugo on the best of days. Um, I won't be betting him here. The other guy looks decent at jiu-jitsu, um, like more superior than Hugo. Um, so yeah, I don't want to know, to be honest. Fair enough. So for me, I'll wait and see what the prop market opens up here. Uh, I do think there's some interesting things in the record. I've rewatched a tape today of Pedro Falcao and James Barnes. And I was like, you know why? Because I thought to myself, I was like, why did they not sign him off of a KO because I was watching his other footage and they're like, yeah, you know, he was uh, surprised and disappointed. They didn't sign him. He was like, I got a KO. What more did they want me to do? Um, you know, whatever. And he went out there and you could tell why the UFC doesn't want to sign him. Like I'm a grappler guys, but he goes out there and he's trying to hold people down. He's trying to smother him from the top position. And listen, if I was out there having cage fights, I'll tell you, I'll probably try and do the exact same thing. I'm not trying to let you punch me in my face, but the guy is like calling him, you know, uh, bad words and saying, come on, sh strike with me on the feet. And he's just taking him back down, uh, you know, trying to have his way with the body triangle, with his uh, grappling game. He is a third degree black belt from uh, Novo Uniao. So he's a very credentialed black belt. Uh, he was actually the trainer for Ode Osborne in his most recent fight. So he's been doing work out in Las Vegas. I think that's why he's able to take this fight on short notice. He's in Vegas. He's been doing work out here uh, in the, the local gyms. And he's definitely a, a credential grappler. He did a tough enough fight, I believe, as well uh, in Vegas. It was another way to just get his foot in the door in the community. And I think that he's, do he's done everything right. You know, he's got a great record on paper. He's got a lot of wins. But I do think that he is vulnerable on the feet. You know, I think that the Barnes fight was a little bit concerning because he was getting out wrestled for portions by a 39 year old man who is very talented, you know, but solid wrestler. But if your A game is wrestle, grapple, you know, it was a bigger guy uh, in Barnes. You know, Barnes was obviously the longer guy, a little bit stronger. But even in round three, when he was supposed to be like, you know, gassed out and all these things, he's like getting back up to his feet. He's switching back to the leg locks. And I just was really surprised. Uh, by some of the footage I was watching from Falcao, given how talented he is. I think he slows down over the course of his fights. And the one thing about Victor Hugo that I think goes a, a little bit unrecognized, uh, and I think he changed his name to Striker so people would recognize it. He's an opportunistic submission guy. A lot of people go out there and try and grapple with him. And he showed in his last fight, counter grappling. You want to grapple with me? Okay. Like, I'll take you down if you try and take me down. I, I'll get on top. And then I'll also use my own, you know, submissions which are very lethal and they've proven to be over time he's gotten multiple leg lock submissions uh so do i want him to go out there and pull leg locks in this fight no i do not but do i think he has got a clear path to knocking this guy out on the feet absolutely i do because i just think that victor hugo is a superior striker i think he's faster and more confident in those positions and I don't know that he's going to gas out if he gets taken down once or twice in this fight. And he's also very talented at jujitsu. I don't think he's going to easily get submitted like some of these guys on the regional scene. He's had a ton of fights. He's only been submitted a handful of times. So it just seems to me like a guy that could go out there and really push the, the gas tank, especially on short notice of Falcao, who has seemed to slow down to me in the past. He was able to get the finish in round three, but that's because his opponent was literally in cardiac arrest. My man Barnes went out there and gave a performance of a lifetime. Like, shout out to him. I want to take my hat off to him, but I don't want to mess up the headphones. So I just think it was a great fight, but it did show the flaws with Falcao's approach. He tires himself out seeking victory. And sometimes that can leave you with nothing left in the tank. And I think he's going to be happy to get signed with the UFC, happy to get a contract. And I think Victor Hugo, uh, you know, was trying to do a favor for the UFC. They tried to turn him around on 32 days notice, Rich, after he got signed. They were like, do it again, like get in here. And he couldn't make the wait. And then people are like, oh, he's a jerk. And I'm like, no, he's not a jerk. He tried to do them a favor. And it was like too much to ask. Like, hey, can you turn it around again? He's a big guy. 
to turn it around again in 32 days, I thought was a big ask. I was surprised he said yes, and he wasn't able to do it, but he tried to be a good company guy. Now he was supposed to fight this guy. They say, hey, switch it up. You got to take on this guy instead. It's a tough matchup on short notice. Falcao is no joke. I don't think he should be a massive favorite here. But if you ask me my gut level prediction, I think that Victor Stryker is going to knock out Pedro Falcao, um, you know, in round two or three. So that's the way I feel about this one. Shout out to everybody who's lighting up the chat. Sharpest chat in the game so yeah, each and every week. Appreciate each and every one of you guys. We got Mushroom, Evan, Gobbler, Benmino, TG, MMA Line Mover. Appreciate everybody who's rocking with us. Thank you guys for the support. And we've got plenty more great fights to talk about, including the next one up. Surprised to see this one so low on the prelims with a card this week and thin. We've got big Norm, Norma Dumont taking on Jermaine Durandamy. Maybe they're just trying to force everybody to watch the prelims. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Um, I think it's pretty basic, to be honest. I can't bet Jermaine coming off the, you know, pregnancy, the time off. Um, they're just too strong of a red flag for me. And Dumont isn't, you know, shit enough to fade based on that. Um, but she is shit, man. Um, she's supposed to be like this jiu-jitsu girl. Well, that's what I thought when she came into the UFC. You know, take girls down, submit them. But yeah, she doesn't get it done, man. It, she rather um, cage pressed, waste some time, um, and just get the W by any means necessary. Um, if she got knocked out, it wouldn't surprise me, but I'm not putting my money on that. Um, but yeah, I'll go demand by decision and by pure um disgustingness it'd just be cage pushing um not much doing of anything the referee telling them to fucking work um and yeah maybe i'll bet jermaine next time but it's like when nina came back um you know from her pregnancy couldn't bet her in her first fight um it's just too much man uh losing the weight um the ring rust the rest of it so yeah do you decision for me but i think you're going the other way man yeah, I think I am going the other way, Rich, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think there's a class difference between these two fighters. And, and listen, I'm I'm as big a fan as of of Norma Dumont as anybody. You go back a few years, I my ass is in the jackpot on a lot of MMA takes, right? Like you could just search my name and like a couple of things, you you'll start finding. Hey, what did he think about this? I've gotten things dead wrong before, but I had put a long time ago like people I thought could make a run that are ranked X through X in their division. And Norma Dumont was like a ranked bantamweight, I believe, despite never having made the weight. It, it, like she was like, just like in the milieu. And then she's up at 145. Now the weight class doesn't exist. So she's back down to 135. And, you know, she's done catch weight. She's done this, that, and the other. She's got to prove that she can make this weight again, you know, get back down to 135 pounds after she hasn't been doing it for a while. So I feel like there's a couple of X factors here where it's like, unknowns push the line a little bit closer to 50 50. I think if you had asked me what what should the real line um be you know if this was like two three years ago like coming off the Juliana Pena fight what is this line I think it's minus 225 to remain Durand to me you know just like personally speaking I feel like she would have been pretty confidently back there by the public as well coming off of a win over of that quality now it's been a couple of years so is she going to be a shell of herself? That's something that you have to try and uh, cap into this. Is like, hey, there's some downside risk with a bet like this. Like, she could be a shell of herself. But if she's not a shell of herself, if she looks like herself in any way, in any form or capacity, she's probably better at every component of MMA than Norma Dumont. And Norma Dumont is a fine grappler. I think she's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Have you ever been blown away or impressed by a Norma Dumont grappling performance? I can tell you I have not. And I, I do think that she's a good all-rounder. She's physical. You know, she can hit hard. She's not afraid of a fight. That's, that's where it ends for me. That's where it starts and ends. And you don't need that many tools to succeed in bantamweight. But if you listen to the interviews from Jermaine Durand to me, she basically said what I was thinking, which is, Hey, this division sucks right now. It's extremely thin. There's nobody here to fight for the title. And I think the UFC wants me to shake it up. I think they want me to go out here and make a statement and, and you know, show why I deserve to fight for the title. And by the way, they're not above giving 40 year olds title shots. Let's be very clear about that. This is WMMA where people do not tend to age out as quickly. And this is the age of post USADA. 
anything is possible. OSP's out here throwing 200 significant strikes in a fight. What are we talking about? I think that this is a fight where I could see both women winning and it's a plus 150 on one side. And if you look at the, the one side, one, if I just said to you, all right, forget everything else. One woman lost twice in the UFC. Her two losses are Amanda Nunes. One woman lost twice in the UFC. Her losses are Macy Chason and Megan Anderson. Who are you taking at plus money odds? <laughs> I will live to find out. Win or loss, I will live to find out with the Iron Lady. She's coming to whoop that ass. I believe it. She ain't running away like Chelsea Chandler. I'll tell you that. So that's how I feel. <laughs> we can move to the next one, my brother. We got Court McGee taking on Alex Morono. And Rich, I wanted to be a contrarian. I wanted to be, you know, ooh, Johnny, Johnny comes with a theory. And I was like, oh, what if what if Morono could go out there and get the submission? And then it's like plus 750 on a guy who's never been submitted his whole career. I'm just like, I mean, like, I guess, like, I, I can still see it happening, but it's like, it, it just doesn't feel like it's great value to me. Um, you know, I do think that Court is a little bit cooked, but I also think he's been losing to guys with proven knockout power. Like, you know, Matt Brown, he could be a little bit older. He could be a little bit past his uh, prime. He could still knock somebody dead with an elbow, with a knee, with a punch. He really knows how to hit somebody hard and he can do that. Um, and I think that when I'm looking at a guy uh, like Court McGee, he's kind of a very solid all rounder but he doesn't really go out there and excel in one position. You know, he doesn't really have a very much danger factor. And I think for a guy like Morono, that's kind of his safety valve. I think he's going to be a lot more confident to come out there and throw when he's been given these assignments, like against the Donald Cerrone and some of these guys that are a little bit older. Uh, I think he tends to do a little bit better in those fights. Obviously guys that carry their power, like Santiago Ponzinibbio, different story, but Court McGee is not really a guy known for that big knockout power. Um, so I don't really expect him to catch Morono here. I don't think he's got the speed to catch Morono at a high clip, but stranger things have happened in MMA. Morono is not the kind of guy I want to lay minus 375 on personally, but I do think he's going to win this fight at a pretty high clip. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, I was considering putting uh, Morono as much of the week, to be honest. Um, but then before he, any of the lines come out and I just glanced at the card, I was like, ah, Morono could get a sub, man. Um, <laughs> McGee's washed. In the end, I've stayed away from it. Um, the line is a bit out there, to be honest. Um, I guess the bookies believe that, you know, McGee's totally washed, obviously coming off the 2KO losses. But um, yeah, I'm not so sure, man. I think uh, this probably goes to decision unless uh, Morano catches him with a, a submission, to be honest. But I don't think he's putting McGee out. So I don't know whether anyone can target the fight like that. Bet the overs, maybe. Um, obviously, the submission is low percentage. McGee's never been sub before. Um, he's a black belt himself. It would be opportunistic. Um, but yeah, my figuring on that is just that, you know, McGee's going to push for the takedown. So he's going to give um, Murano all the opportunity to hit a guillotine. That's what I was thinking. Um, but yeah, I got bigger fish to fry on the card. So I've just left it alone, to be honest. Same yeah, I feel the same way. It's a really weird fight. You know, uh, I'm glad that they're not just like sending Court McGee out there to, to the absolute slaughter, but um, it does still feel like he's probably going to be just a little bit outpaced here by a guy like Morono who's constantly throwing and moving and doing things. So that's the way that it feels to me. Next up, my man, speaking of guys that are constantly moving and throwing and doing things, we got Trevor Peak taking on Charlie Campbell. Why don't you lead us off on this one, Rich? Oh, I love Trevor Peak, man. Love watching his fights. Seems like a cool guy. Um, but yeah, I just wish he wasn't as green as he is, man. Like, he's making mistakes everywhere and he's striking, like throwing hammer fists, um, you know, double spinning, back fists. I even seen him fucking try on somebody. Um, he's grappling against Chepe, got totally exposed. I'm so surprised that he didn't get submitted in that fight, to be honest. Um, but yeah, he just powers out of things with like grit and determination, man. Um, there's like no quitting him. Um, I, li I like his facial expressions during the fights as well. Like the guy's literally trying to take people's heads off. So yeah, I love some peak fights, to be honest, but uh, I'm going against him here. And um, yeah, I'm going to fade him, man. I'm going to fade him to get subbed. 
Um, I think a lot of people are based on how this line's gone for um, Charlie Campbell. It is a bit of a risk on Campbell, to be honest, because when I watched that fight with Duncan on Dana White Contender Series, he had Duncan on skates and he just, for whatever reason, wouldn't initiate in the grappling, wouldn't take his back. Um, when Duncan was trying to like latch on to him to survive, he was brushing him off and still trying to strike. I don't know what that's all about. But I'm playing the number. Um, it was around 600 when I got it. Um, I think that is wide on a fight where I do think he's going to put Peak out. Uh, like I said, Pete just makes too many mistakes. And as he goes up in competition, um, not that Charlie's anything to write home about, but he is slightly better than the people he's been fighting, in my opinion. So when I figure Charlie's going to finish the fight, uh, it's a 50-50 outcome. I get plus 600 on one of the outcomes bet. Uh, and that's that's how I do my maths, man. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with it. But I just think if they, um, you know get into an entanglement on the ground, Charlie can uh, wrap him up, man. So fingers crossed. There you go. I, I do think that's possible for sure. Um, I do think Peak is is green. I think that's a fair assessment. I also think he's a really tough guy to put away because, you know, one of these things that I always talk about, you can't tough guy a choke. And that would be a really smart approach from Campbell and company in this fight is to try and put this guy in a choke that puts him to sleep because that's the way you beat a guy like Trevor Peak. You know, you don't want to be dealing with this guy for a long time. He goes out there and swings heavy and he's trying to take your head off the whole time. He's a very violent guy and there's not a lot of technique behind it all, but it's just not a fun fight ever when you're getting dragged into the mud like that. And Chepe has had a lot of fights. You know, he's been knocked out a couple of times. Like, he's already been through the ringer. You know, it's like after you've been uh, knocked out a few times, like, what are you going to do to me now that I haven't seen before, right? And I think that he used his veteran experience, like you said, the grappling difference. But Chepe is a guy that needs to use his veteran savvy in a lot of these fights to win, right? Like, if he just goes out there power shot for power shot, he's, he's had a couple guys take him out. When I'm looking at this fight, Charlie Campbell – you know, it's one of the bets that will always haunt me, you know, because I can accept the Gavin Tucker loss at plus 130 against Danny he gets so much better, Rich, because at least nothing positive happened. I He went out there, he threw nothing, and he got killed. Okay, I'm with you. fair enough. Take my money. But to have him go out there and dominate every second of the fight, and then Chris Duncan loads up the most predictable right hand of all time and just decks him. And then they're showing his family in the crowd. I was like, I cannot <laughs> believe this is happening right now. It felt like a, a horror movie to me. I had three units, $300 of U.S. currency on Charlie Campbell. And, Rich, I was already counting the money. I, I was like, this is over. He's got him rocked. He's beating him up. He's doing everything. And, and to just go out there and swing like that, like a madman was so baffling to me and it really hurt my feelings. Now, could that be a fluke, right? Like if they ran that back, could, could he just go out there and beat Duncan? I think he probably would beat Duncan if they ran that back. But it, it for me is enough to just say like the days of me laying minus one XX minus two XX with this guy are gone because when you've got a guy just shooting into you and you could take his back, get on top, get to a dominant position. And like you said, Rich, you're just inviting volatility, saying like, no, get back up to the feet and let me keep throwing wild shots with my hands at my hips and like just taking risk. And that's what young, crazy, like thrill-seeking fighters do. He's a, he's a great fighter. He's a fun fighter, scary fighter, got skills in all positions. But I just worry that he's going to go out there and this guy who's like throwing hammer fists in his head is going to get him mad and he's going to start swinging with him. And I just don't think that that's a good idea against Trevor Peak because I think he's willing to take an insane amount of damage to try and kill you, you know? And, like, I think he's probably going to be in really good shape for this fight. Um, so, yeah. Shout out to the real TP in the chat. It says, I heard Trevor is training with Chepe. That's good luck. Charlie looked like he was ready uh, to go last fight, but he held on. Um, I think that Charlie, is, you know, he showed a good performance last time out, but again, he was like minus 400 favor. I just thought that that was a clear setup, kind of what he was supposed to do. And I think that in this fight, like both these guys have similar, you know, metrics and whatever. It's just like, who's more marketable in my opinion, it, it ain't Trevor Pete. 
um, even if it's just by hair. So shout out to Charlie the Cannibal, New York guy. We're rooting for him, but it's also a spot where, you know, I'm just not counting out Trevor Peak ever because uh, he goes out there with violent intent and he's been favored in most of these fights. When he was a dog on Contender Series, that's the only time I ever bet him. I bet him plus 250 by knockout. He's got that dog in him, man. Even if you come out and start hitting him and hurting him early, if you do not put him out, he will continue throwing um, in, until he can put you out. So that, that last hammer fist that he landed on the kid he knocked out in the UFC was cool, <laughs> dude. He literally just throws like a up hammer fist and just slaps him back into the cage. Um, he's a madman. So Do you know what? To, to watch. Yeah, go ahead. If, if Peak knocks Charlie out and I lose my bet, I won't even be mad. So whatever. Good for him. Yep. Yep. I think that Campbell's got the long limbs that I always talk about as a great component for a submission bet. So I definitely think it's on the table here. If he's got the the sense that God gave geese, that's what should happen. But I just worry that uh, he, he could make some crazy mistakes if this fight stays on the feet. So let's, let's hope that he goes out there to grapple. Next up, we've got Lukas Breschke taking on Walter Walker. And this is a fight in the heavyweight division. The debuting Walter Walker is 11-0. And Lukash Breski is a less impressive 8-4-1. However, he has been fighting pretty quality guys in the UFC. I know the names don't jump out like, oh, my God, these guys are rock solid. But you just look at the records on paper. Carl Williams, 3-0 and in the promotion, hasn't lost. Martin Budai, 4-1 and in the promotion. Waldo Cortez Acosta, 4-1 and in the promotion. These guys don't really lose a lot of fights. So it's like he's gone out there. He's lost to some guys that were supposed to beat him. He's been an underdog in all these fights. And now a guy who's never won a UFC fight, ne never beaten a UFC quality fighter as far as I'm concerned. Um, Alex Nicholson, fine fighter, but he's 15 and 10 now as a professional. Not a not a standout record. Took him to the fourth round there. Um, so good enough cardio for a heavyweight, I suppose. But also when you're not meeting resistance, it, it's not as difficult to show cardio. Um so when I look at this fight on paper, I just say to myself, like, again, we're in the age of post-USADA. We've got a guy who's on the fourth fight of his UFC deal, meaning he has popped for something in the past before. Now USADA is gone, and he's on the last fight of his contract. We th we're expecting him to not do juice. Like, I, I think this guy's going to be juice to the gills. And I'm seeing abs on Instagram that I haven't seen in a while, right? So I think this weird-looking, skinny, fat, you know, strange looking guy, Bresky, you know, with all love and respect, I say this, I think he <laughs> is a live underdog in this fight. And the reason, Rich, I feel that way is because Walter Walker, you know, he's training at a uh, Gore MMA with uh, Bogdan Guskov. And we liked Bogdan Guskov coming into the UFC. And, you know, he ended up coming through in that most recent fight, right? Knocked out Zach Palga bad. But I think the jury's still out, right? Like, you know, he lost to the guy he was kind of supposed to lose to in Vulcan Ostemir. Then people got ahead of themselves on Zach Palga, but he was never really proven at the UFC level in a lot of ways. The only guy to get knocked out by Muhammad Usman, for example. So I think that when I'm looking at a guy like, um, you know, Bresky in this spot, he's fighting for his UFC job. So he's got to come out here with all the motivation in the world if he wants to stay in the, in the employee of the company. Otherwise, there'll be no more bets to be had on the Bresky side. And in the other case, right, I'm looking at a guy in Walter Walker. How many guys pull a terrible performance in their debut? How many guys get overwhelmed by the moment of the UFC? I know we're in the apex. I know it should be a smaller event, but it's like UFC, pressure of being Johnny Walker's brother, ranked guy, all this stuff. It's like maybe that pressure makes diamonds, but it also makes coal. You know, it's like it, it also just goes out there and people lay an egg and they have a stinker performance. So to just go minus three XX on this guy, it's like, first of all, this is heavyweight fighting. Like how many guys are justifying minus three XX in heavyweight fights? I think you'd have to go through the list. Maybe it's because they expect him to get takedowns. Is he as proven as Carl Williams with the wrestling? Like Carl Williams taking everybody down multiple times, except for one guy. It's like, I don't know. I, I just feel that this is a, uh, a prove it spot for Walter Walker. And I don't think he's proven much of anything. I wish him the best here. He's still, you know, big enough, strong guy. Maybe he can go out there and get takedowns, but prove it in the UFC. And for Lukas Bresky, 
He has to do that too, right? He's got to prove it in the UFC this time. He went out there against Martin Budai, had a competitive fight, outlanded him, landed over 100 significant strikes. In the win on Contender Series, landed 80 significant strikes. So I just think that this is a guy that can go out there, land a lot of strikes, make this guy work in the clinch, get back up if he gets taken down like we saw against Carl Williams, and maybe he gets finished by Walter Walker, or maybe Walter Walker is a complete fraud and just falls apart. And at minus two XX, I'm never going to pay to find out, but at plus, you know, two XX, I'm willing to find out. So Lucas Breski is the side for me. How do you feel, Rich? Yeah, I understand uh, why you'd like the side of the underdog, um, but we've talked about this before, man. We like obviously bet differently. Um, although I think like a line might be off, I don't always necessarily like take the plunge um, on it. And I'm the same in this one, man. Like um, Walker obviously hasn't had any UFC fights, um, but he still doesn't have to prove anything to me. I think I know where he's at from watching the tape. I think I know what he's capable of from watching the tape. And the same with Bretsky, man. I've got a good sample size now. He's been in the UFC. Um, I don't think he's UFC caliber. Sometimes the guys he's fighting aren't either, like Boudet. Um, you know, I think that's heavyweight, though, in the UFC, man. We just got a pile of shit and then, like, one or two good guys at the top. It just is the way, the way it is. Um, yeah, when I first watched tape, I thought there was a world where Walker wouldn't get his takedowns in round two or three, and then Bretsky could put it on him. Um, he does look slimmer now. He might be on, you know, the juice, um, have improved endurance, improved cardio, maybe. Um, but I don't think it's going to matter that much, even if he has. Um, I think the physicality of Walker, although he may go, you know, balls to the wall in round one and try and get some blast doubles, lift him off his feet even, I still think... He'll have enough in the tank, come round two and three to at least cage push, use his like six foot six frame to hold him against the cage. And um, I fancy him for a decision, to be honest, Walker. Um, I think it's going to go exactly like that. He's going to come out hot, um, go for these blast doubles, these eccentric takedowns. Um, but yeah, in two or three, a slow down, but I still think he'll do enough. Um, and I don't think bretsky has got it in him, to be honest, to like make a rally late. Um, although I think he will have the better cardio, I don't think it's superior in the way that he can just like flip the switch after, you know, a round and a half of being on his back or, you know, defending takedowns to be able to just, like I say, flip that switch and be like, right, I'm going to put it on you now. Um, you know, the steroids are going to kick in. I don't see it that way, man. So staying away from it, Walker's unplayable because of the number. I'll fade him another day. Um, but yeah, if you're betting it, good luck with it, man, because I ain't got no action on it. Yeah, and the one other thing I'll add is just like I was really unimpressed by Walker's striking. Like he just looks very slow, basic. Oh yeah. Um, like if he's not getting takedowns here, I feel like the line will flip very quickly. Um, but that's it's the one thing I, I would say. And if he is getting takedowns, he could go to a minus a thousand favorite in round one. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's a very volatile fight. <laughs> but for me, I just feel like there's some potential upside on Bresky if he looks like he's getting dogged and getting tired in the first round then I'll probably just end up leaving it alone. But if it looks like they had a competitive round one and it's like mostly stayed on the feet and they're giving me plus money odds on Bresky because he lost the first round, I might add a little bit to my position. Um, Cause I just don't, I don't think that Walker is like as dangerous as his record makes him out to be. So we'll have to see. Yeah. But don't you think that he doesn't need to be, you know, I agree Walker's striking shit, but Bretzky's is too. And if they're both tired mid round two and Walker's like, you know, a round up on his way to win the second round, he can easily just cage push, hold him against. He doesn't need to be like decent strike, and it's not like Bretsky can put there, it on. There's him not like a him. huge size difference between these two guys, though. Like Bretsky himself is a pretty big guy in terms of length. You know, I just feel like they'll probably be competitive in the cage push, and I actually trust Bretsky to throw more in those situations, like you know, uh, short shots in the clinch, knees, elbows, stuff like that. I feel like in a dirty, disgusting decision fight where the guy's not getting takedowns, I almost like the person that's more insistent on striking. So I do think he might be a little bit more insistent on striking, but we'll have to we'll have to see. You know, I just think that this is a prove it spot for Bresky, man. Uh, like Jarno Aaron's a couple of weeks back, when you got a couple of these losses in a row in the UFC, you know, it's either the road out the door or you find a way to win one of these effing fights, and uh, they're giving him a guy that didn't even come through the contender series, right? Like, he's just like, hey, I'm here. Like, welcome. 
And I think the contender series gives these guys a little bit of experience, but in this case, he's kind of just getting thrown in like, Hey, all right, let's figure it out. So I think that uh, I'm interested to see how Walter Walker performs. I'll be happy to celebrate him if he gets the win, but for me, give me the hungry Lucas Bresky juice to the gills. Next up, we've got Ignacio Bahamundes taking on Christos Yagos. And this is uh, two guys at different points in their career, right, Rich? We got the younger guy here in Bahamundes who has been struggling a little bit at the UFC level, but he's obviously quality training out of Valley Flow Striking Academy in Chicago, Illinois, quality fighter. Christos Yagos, on the other hand, another guy who's been mostly losing to very good fighters, but he doesn't really have any quality wins either. You know, he's kind of just a guy that's been that measuring stick opponent. He's found out some guys that weren't for real, um, but he also has not really shown himself to be, uh, you know, an elite level UFC fighter. I think some of his wins have been a little bit fortunate, caught a couple guys at the right time, like Ricky Glenn, who just seemed like um, he might be done with, with fighting at that point of his career. So interesting spot. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Um, yeah, it's hard to be a believer in Ignacio because his game's just so shit, man. He's, um, been like minus two XX twice, lost both times. One was his like last fight and he's just underwhelming. Um, you'd think for his like build, um, he'd be able to dominate people at this weight class, but like, tell me what he's good at, man. What he's great at. Um, not much of anything to be honest. Um, We've seen him against Klein. Klein's tiny, man. He was susceptible to the takedown. The only reason... I'm not betting him here because he's minus uh, two, whatever he is, um, and I don't like the price. But I do think he still wins. That's just because of the little faith I have in um, Christos. I don't believe in him, man. Never have. Always been flaky. Um, you know, he could be winning a fight, do something good, and then you just know he's going to fuck it up and get himself subbed or something. And that's how I feel this fight's going to go. Ignacio is going to be underwhelming um, early. Christos is going to have some success, you know, look good. People are going to be like, here we go again. And then out of nowhere, Ignacio is going to snatch up a guillotine, something crazy like that. And you go, like, right, there it is. Um, so, yeah, I'll fade Ignacio some other time when it's not um, someone as flaky as Christos. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm looking to hit a prop. Don't know what yet. Um We'll see, but that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. You know, I don't trust him at this chalk price. I can tell you that for sure. I even bet uh, Yagos against Tiago Moises are at a similar price because Tiago Moises can sometimes fold up the tent under pressure early. And of course, Yagos comes out there and gets barnstormed in the first round. And I was like, okay, Yagos is just not for real. Um, but when I think about this spot, man, I say to myself, you know, the Bahamonde sub prop has gotten absolutely nuked. Um, I do think there is some submission equity for both guys because I do think Yagos in the early going is probably more physically strong and a little bit more technical with his grappling. But I also think that he's pretty reliable to start falling apart as the fight gets extended in rounds two and three. So I think that the sub price is actually gross at this point. I, I think that TG makes a good point. Like Ignacio sub plus 300 against a guy that is like on paper as good or a better grappler than him. Um, and additionally, it's like you just look and, and you say to yourself, Ignacio has one submission win and it was against uh, Zhu Rong, who is UFC quality, right? Just fought his way back to the UFC on road to UFC. But he was also a guy at the time that was struggling at the UFC level. Uh, so I think it was a lot to do with fatigue. And I think that that's the opportunity, the lane for him to finish here. But we've also seen, he's not just a guy that will go out there and pursue subs. Like Roosevelt Roberts was pretty tired late in that fight. And he kicked his head damn near into the third row. It's pretty crazy. So uh, I think that this is a fight where Ignacio has all the opportunity to go out there and submit, but it does feel like it's like, potential mush of the week territory. And I know people are going to say you can't make a mush plus money, but uh, I just think that when you look, uh, it, it does seem like it's a very popular angle, at least among the betting community, but it's also, you know, sometimes the popular angles that are really sharp and move a lot are sharp for a reason and they just hit. So I think that this could hit as well, but I might target it a little bit different because I think that it probably gets extended into rounds two and three. And I think that Ignacio, uh, is dangerous with his knees, elbows, 
we've seen Iago's finish via strikes twice, I believe. So, yeah, there, there's just some signals to me that this could go a couple different ways, but certainly the multitude of voters on Tapology are expecting a knockout from Bahamondes, and I think that he's live by either method of finish. And I think Iago's is live in round one. You know, I don't blame people that took the plus 1,200 or whatever was out there on Iago's because that's basically his path to winning UFC fights for the most part is he's got to go out there and barnstorm somebody early. He does have power in the first round. He does have some submission equity early, but the fact that it took him to round two to submit Sean Soriano, it just tells me everything I need to know here. Uh, he's probably just not going to make it at this level. Next up, man, we got Morgan Chevy a little closer to your neck of the woods there over in the cage warrior scene, taking on Chepe machine gun Mariscal. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, I was on the Chepe train and now it's time to get off. Um, I think he's going to get outclassed, uh, to be honest. I think he's too wild and I don't think that's going to make a, uh, you know, it's gonna, not going to serve him well against someone like Morgan. Um, yeah, I like him, man. I think the ceiling's high for this guy, especially for like the French MMA scene, which obviously the UFC are trying to get into. I don't think it's a coincidence that he's fighting a week after Firo. Um, I expect them to be on a card together soon. Um, and they'll have Morgan on the main event again. I think he's one of the brighter prospects in France. And um, yeah, he's got a complete game, man. He's technical with it as well. Doesn't rush in. I can see Chepe getting um, knocked out pretty um, at a high clip, man, to be honest. Just because um, Morgan's clean with everything and Chepe is just a wild man. Like him, um, his game's not really well put together. In my opinion, he's just had fortunate ball. Uh, matchups, but even the fight against um, Jack Jenkins, you know, round one um, was a bit sticky for a minute, man, until um, he got that lucky uh, arm break or whatever it was in that fight. So, yeah, I'm not sure how he gets it done, but I think the money line's crazy. Um, to be honest, obviously, Chepe's getting a lot of love. Uh, I'm not seeing it myself, to be honest. It's just going to force me to make a bigger bet on Morgan. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at, man. I just think he outclasses him everywhere and he's more technical, um, to be honest. And the fights that he lost in cage warriors, they were bullshit, to be honest. Um, the one against Jordan, especially I'd even use the word robbery. Um, but yeah, the one against Hughes as well, I felt like could have gone to him, but the one against Jordan, um, those who have watched it, I don't know whether you agree or disagree, but I thought that was a complete robbery, man. It was some bullshit, but yeah, Morgan for the win. There you have it. Um, I think that this is an interesting fight. You know, Chepe's done very well. I haven't done perfect picking his fights. You know, I, I I think I've underrated his skills a little bit coming into the UFC. And or maybe I've overstated, you know, the knockout losses, right? He has been finished in the first round a number of times. But he's definitely a tough guy. He's definitely fought a very high quality of opposition throughout his career. But I do think that when you're talking about Morgan Chatier, He's fought the highest quality competition Cage Warriors has to offer. Those are the only guys he's losing to are at the very high end of that distribution. So I think he's a good fighter with a lot of experience and he's young, um, you know, relative. I, I got to check the stats here, but uh, coming in 28 years of age with a lot of professional experience under his belt, that matters to me. And I do think Chepe has been fighting good guys. But, um, you know, if this line is to flip and Morgan becomes the underdog, which it looks like he's poised to become, that would actually fit a system for me uh, long term of just taking fighters with more professional experience when they flip to underdog odds. And uh, so that's something I'll definitely look to consider here. I respect Chepe's game. I think he's a very good fighter. Um, but I also think that, you know, one of these guys has shown, you know, the way to beat him is to edge out a very close split decision. The other guy has shown you know, you could beat him by knocking him out, you know, brutally in the first round or by catching him, clipping him, uh, you know, being a little bit more fast and athletic. And so he's beaten good guys and I, I'm not counting him out here. I think plus money is the way though. And I think that if this line flips here, uh, you know, it's certainly going to be hard for me to ignore the plus money on Mortigan Chetier. Next up, we've got the most random co-main event of all time. Am I wrong about this, Rich? Like, what a strange random. pairing for a co-main event. We've got Alexander the Great Ape, also a random nickname change, taking on Damon the Leech Jackson. And Damon Jackson shows up looking like he's five years younger. My man's out here doing the damn thing. Hey, God bless him for it. 
I guess he he got that fifty thousand dollar bonus check from the Sabatini fight, and he started booking appointments. But you look at this guy, Damon Jackson, and you know he's a dangerous uh, guy in a couple of different positions. He could take the back, he could do these things, but he also is a guy that you know he kind of needs people to be tired to get most of his game going. Uh, the Sabatini fight, you know, an exception to that, but we've seen Pat his biggest struggle in his professional career has just been durability, right? Taking big shots to the chin and not being braced for them, not being able to move out of the way of those shots. And I'm looking at a guy in this fight, um, you know, where I, I think that Damon Jackson has looked a little bit uh, slower in some of his recent fights, right? He's 35 years of age, going on 36, a little bit older for the division. Hernandez is a guy I've never really trusted, right? He kind of gasses out considerably. ABC say always been on cardio, broke that rule with Herbert Burns last week, paid the price. So when you look at some of these examples, like I do think Leach has shown not great cardio because he gasses out sometimes in the third round as well, but the ability to just keep working when he's tired. And I think that sometimes Hernandez has lacked that ability, but you know, in his recent performances, I think he's showing the right attitude in terms of, hey, I'm coming down to the weight class. Like I'm I'm trying to get to a weight class that's more favorable for me um, at this stage of my career, doing it the right way. And I also think that the Miller fight is a pretty decent win for Hernandez, not because, you know, um, they're the same age or things like that, but he managed the fight well. He got a 15 minute decision against a savvy vet who's dangerous in all positions. That, for me, spoke volumes to him making some improvements. And I think this is still a hard fight for him. But I think that Hernandez, just in the first round, he's so much faster. He's dynamic. He's athletic. He could go out there and knock out Damon Jackson, I think, in the first round here. Uh, the longer the fight goes, the more dangerous it gets. But I just have a feeling that Alex is, is going to be a little bit too much physically for Damon at this stage of their career. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, we kind of see it the same, man. Um just a little bit different. <laughs> I think it's going to be a late um, finish from Hernandez. And that's why I didn't take the dog money on Jackson, which I initially wanted to. Um, yeah, when you watch the tape on Jackson, Jackson rain free isn't a good look anymore. Um, you know, he's gassed to fuck, to be honest. And um, just looking to get that clinch, uh, get you down and, uh, you know, burn the clock. And I think Hernandez is going to have the better gas tank come round three. I can totally see Jackson taking him down in round one and doing his thing, you know, putting the body triangle on, burning the clock, maybe. Um, but yeah, when they come out in round two or three, I think it's going to be all Hernandez, man. I think, you know, them takedowns and Jackson holding on to him, he just hasn't got the body for it anymore, to be honest. He's just getting up there in age. Like you said, he's looking slow. In his interview that I watched, he even sounded a bit punch drunk, man. The way he, he speaks is like very slow um, with his um, talk. But yeah, um, it's hard to get some money on this fight because Hernandez by KO was like plus 130, something stupid like that, which I won't take. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll look at round two, three for Hernandez and try and target it that way. But I would have been on Jackson, man, if it wasn't for that round three um, because... Hernandez, to be honest, I think he's always going to be a mental midget. I think he's always going to doubt himself. Um, but I think it depends on who the opponent is. Um, you know, even in the Jim Miller fight in round three, Jim was able to get him down because I bet Jim by sub in that fight. I was like, here it is. I've got like a minute left. And, you know, he almost, well, he didn't almost get it, but he was in the position to get it. So, yeah, you can never totally trust Hernandez. So I'm just conflicted with this fight, like I am with many fights on this card. Um but yeah, my official pick will be Hernandez. Probably knocks him out in round two or three. Yeah, I'm trying to just think of ways I could be creative or a little bit different on this fight. And, um, you know, I'm thinking there's a couple of props I'm going to take a look at here. When you look at how Damon Jackson uh, pursues the fight, you know, he's pretty um, committed to going out there and looking for his submissions. Uh, so I, I think he's going to try and force the grappling one way or the other. And, that, that for me is something where uh, I like to to look at the prop market uh, when I see that kind of dynamic. So, Do you know I'll what's take crazy? A look. Yeah, go ahead. Back in the day, Hernandez beat OAM when OAM, you know, had youth on his side while he was fucking, it was like, it feels like three, four years ago, maybe even five years ago. And, you know, he beats OAM, how OAM beat people. So you'd be inclined to think, oh, Hernandez has got solid grappling, but and then you see him in other fights, man. And it's like that fight didn't exist and he's just... 
I don't know. He's just very hit or miss Hernandez. Um, you know, if the Hernandez who showed up in that 08 AM fight, you know, if you could guarantee me that, I'd be all over him here. But like I said, can't trust the guy in it. Yeah, for sure. He's not a trustworthy individual, uh, especially at the price. But I do think that, you know, athletic upside is definitely on the Hernandez side. And he's got a record that does not reflect how good he is in terms of like, um, you know, 14 and seven. He's also gone out there and beaten some of the best guys in the division. So obviously you look back and a lot of those, you know, you probably wouldn't pick them to win those matchups again. But to your point, when those guys were solid in their prime, like really respected fighters, he beat them. And oftentimes he beat them cleanly, finished them. Uh, in the case of Benil Darius. So he, he's a dangerous guy. I think he lost a lot of his confidence in the Cowboy Cerrone fight. I think it's been a struggle for him to get that back. But, you know, his response at the media day this week says a lot about it, right? You know, I'm not going to repeat it, but man's out there just like, you know, if you're still thinking about that, that, that ain't the way I'm thinking about it. So, um, you know, and I kind of feel the same way. He's trying to move forward in his career. And I think he's still a dangerous guy at 31 years of age. He could always put something together but you can't trust him to do that at a big chalk price. So I, I think that there's a couple of different ways to get creative though. So I, I'll, I'll report back to you guys on that. Next up, my man, the main event, the talk of the town want to get to the main event here, but I just want to say before we get started, please go on ahead and like the show. If you haven't already get subscribed to the channel, we're here talking fights each and every week. And next week we got big plans, a panel show <laughs> coming your way for UFC 300. You will not want to miss it. So make sure you get subscribed, hit that bell for notifications. We're going to have a great show and it's all thanks to the sharpest chat in the game. Thank you all for being here. Rich, go ahead and start us off. How do you feel about this main event of the evening? A rematch going down in the middleweight division. Brendan Allen Allen, Chris, the action man, Curtis. How do you feel about this rematch? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll echo them sentiments as well. We got a panel show for the 300 um, event next week. You don't want to miss it, man. It's going to be some good shit. Um, yeah, much of the week this week is Chris Curtis. Um Bitches have been crying at me on Twitter because, you know, this is the first time that I've had much of the week where it hasn't been a heavy chalk favorite. Um, but I don't know what you want me to do, man. Um, mush is the mush. And I'll say it one more time. The mush is dictated by who the horsemen are on on Twitter. And that's the mainly it. And then who the majority are picking. Everyone on my Twitter timeline is picking Curtis. I can understand it. Not much has changed. I mean, not to make last time it is what it is. Um, but yeah, my official breakdown of this fight will be exactly that. Nothing's really changed. I could see a world where Curtis does exactly the same thing. He just waits. He be patient. You know, he doesn't need, know how to fight any other way anyway. So he's just going to stand in the middle, you know, wait to counter. Um, not much movement from him. No offensive wrestling. No offensive leg kicks. Um, you know. There's no surprises coming from Curtis. But then I can see another world where, you know, like Alan said himself in his interview, the first time was fluke. Um, and he puts it on him. You know, it's short notice for Curtis as well. I don't like that. Um, it does sound like this is just, you know, him, you know, catching a, a paycheck here. He said it himself. You know, he likes the money, uh, et cetera. So it's all on Alan, man. It's on Alan to um, put it on him, you know right the wrong from the first time but my problem with alan is he's a mental midget he's a head case he says weird things in his interviews just like alex hernandez you know there's a handful of these people in the ufc i could write a little book on them to be honest and alan's one of them man um very deluded when he talks about his fights um you know when sean strickland knocked him out curtis knocked him out i think they, those were like easy picks um, just based on the stylistic matchups. So even though Curtis is mush of the week, I am still conflated. You know, I can see it going either way, but I don't give a fuck. I'm not betting on the fight. I had to pick a mush, otherwise people would cry again. So I've been forced to push, um, pick Curtis. Um, so it is what it is. And prop of the week this week is that uh, Japanese girl in PFL, Kana, Kanta, um, by submission. So yeah, there's that. There you have it. The prop of the week, the mush of the week, all in one swift segment. Now we'll turn it to my thoughts on this main event, man. And um, I rewatched some footage on this fight and 
you know, I have to say, it's still a hard fight for me to call. The last time out, I bet the fight ends by KO, and then I bet Allen by KO. And I think that, you know, both of the prices are now lower than they were the last time that they ran this fight. So I'm just trying to pull that up right now. The ends by KO is like plus 210 right now. It was plus 3XX the last time they fought. And then Allen by KO was plus 900. And Allen by KO right now, again, I'm just trying to pull up uh, these resources through fight numbers, bang, plus 850. So yeah, you're looking at a guy in Allen. Uh, that, that line is coming up a little bit on FanDuel. Uh, I think there's been a lot of movement towards the Brendan Allen submission prop. And you just see Brendan Allen is a submission first fighter. He hurt Bruno Silva in his last fight, and he starts going with some ground and pound, passes the guard, goes for the submission. You've seen that in all of his recent fights. When he hurts people, he's he's going to look uh, to pass, get to the submission angles right away. And he's got a great rear naked choke, right? But we did see Curtis deal with some of those positions in the first fight. And he's only been submitted one time in a very lengthy professional MMA career. I think Brendan Allen is a difficult guy to deal with on top of you because he's so long and he knows how to leverage his body to keep pressure on you. He's also had five round fights with the likes of Fluffy Hernandez. Fluffy Hernandez just has cardio for days, right? And uh, Brendan was making a ton of mistakes in that fight because he was young. He was still raw as a fighter. He's gotten a lot better positionally with his jiu-jitsu on the mat. And now he's out there just like submitting black belts, moving well. But you look at the Malcoon fight and it's cause for concern. You look at the fact Bruno Silva, guys, just got boxed up by Chris Weidman. I know he got eye poked. I know that there's a lot of sob stories to be had. I'm not even kidding. Bruno Silva is one of my favorite fighters. He was wrong done in that fight. But Chris Weidman was also boxing his fucking ears off in the early portions of that fight. He was wrestling as well, but he was landing good shots on the feet. Because Bruno Silva is kind of just there to be hit. He's a a tough, durable guy. He's been in the pocket a long time. But he got rocked by Brendan Allen after landing a ton of big shots and rocking Brendan Allen several times. Brendan Allen looked wobbly on his feet in that fight. And to your point, Rich, the Sean Strickland fight, you know, that was a fight where Brendan Allen was, I believe, a favorite going in. I think he was minus 120, if my memory serves. And he goes out there and gets lit up by Sean Strickland badly. I think Sean Strickland landed like 95 significant strikes in, you know, and the under one and a half hit, you know what I'm saying? Like he went out there and whooped his ass so fast and that was at 195 pound catch weight. So Sean Strickland came in, you'd think a little bit slower, a little bit, uh, you know, maybe uh, more reserved. No, he went out there crazy with the aggression and um, he, he just whooped on it. Right. Then you look at the Chris Curtis fight. And I do think Brendan Allen was losing focus. You know, he's like talking to Sean outside the cage. He was arrogant, in my opinion, like thinking, hey, I already got this guy figured out. And now you're seeing a guy in Brendan Allen who has been a lot more focused in his recent fights. You know, he did deal with the adversity of getting rocked by Bruno Silva and then came back from it, did well in that spot. Um, So I, I like a lot of what I've seen from Brendan Allen. But when you look at some of these opponents that he's been facing recently, you just say to yourself, like, are any of them a great analog for Chris Curtis, who's got very good takedown defense? He's difficult to submit on the ground. And he's very, you know, dangerous on the feet, right? You could go out there and compete on the feet. I think that it's still a fight where I expect it to end by knockout more often than not. You know, I think Brendan Allen has a little bit of a point to prove. I think he's got an ego, um, you know, the size of Louisiana. I'm just kidding. Um, but I think that when you look at this guy, he does have knockouts on the regional scene. He does hit with some power. He's got a great body kick. He was absolutely torching Kunaele Soriano with that from distance. And that's, I believe that's another extreme couture fighter. So I think that when you look at um, his ability to skirt along the outside, throw kicks, mix up his shots, that would be the path to making this an easier fight, frustrating Curtis, slowing him down. He's the guy on short notice. But Curtis seems like a guy who stays in good shape. He seems like a guy who's quite durable throughout the course of his career. So I think it's an honest fight, but the lack of line movement concerns me, right? I do see a lot of love on the Chris Curtis side. I know a lot of sharps on the Chris Curtis side. I see a lot of market activity on the Chris Curtis side. It's staying about plus 170, plus 180. And sometimes that's indicative of, hey, you know, the bookmaker has a one really sharp customer that they really respect that took an opinion here and they're willing to go down with the ship and find out 
if they're right or not. And um, that's the way that this game works sometimes, right? Sometimes people have sharper information. And I just I want to watch the market closely on this. I do think that Chris Curtis is a dangerous fight for Brendan Allen. But I think Brendan Allen has matured. I, I thought he was going to comfortably beat Marvin Vittori. And so I don't want to get honey dicked here by, oh, he, you know, he lost to this guy in the past. Chris Curtis hasn't looked like the best version of himself in some of his recent fights, right? He's had a little bit up and down performances, split decision, eats one out over Mark Andre Berrio in Canada. So he's done, you know, some good work. He goes out there and fights hard fights, but he's also a guy that invites a lot of risk in his own right. You know, goes out there and swings in the pocket. When you do that long enough, you start to get a little bit older. You're trading with these young guys at 185. Chris Curtis has said it himself in 50 interviews this week. He's like, hey, you know, it's fighting. We're big guys. You start throwing hands around. Sometimes people get hurt. They get knocked out. That could just happen to Chris Curtis this time. And that's kind of the thing that I'm thinking is a little contrarian here. I think a lot of people expect the submission for Brendan Allen, but I think he's going to go out there and try and strike point fight from the outside. And if he senses an opportunity, if he senses Curtis slowing down or getting hurt, getting injured, anything like that, I think he's going to try and take him out with strikes and uh, prove a point in this one. So that's the way I see it going down. But I definitely see some betting value on Chris Curtis at plus 180. I just can't take it knowing what I know about the market right now um, unless something changes between now and fight time. So that's the thing. I'd like to consider it top down, bottom up from every angle I can. And I just think right now I'm not seeing enough market response to all the money that's coming in on Chris Curtis. And it almost seems too easy, right? Like, oh, he knocked him out last time. You know, he beat but last time he was a, a what? Like minus 400 favorite. So now he's like minus 200 in this spot. Maybe there is value on Brendan Allen. Maybe he does beat him three uh, you know, times out of five. You know, Maybe he does beat him four times out of five. You have to ask yourself these questions uh, to ascertain value. But for me, I, I don't feel confident enough to back Brendan Allen minus 215. But I think that he's a guy that can go out there and win this fight um, with more methods of victory. So that, that ultimately leads me to think he should be favored here. Yeah, the only thing to add, man, is I don't think he has matured, to be honest, Alan, when I hear him speak. I just think he's had the fortunate matchups like Paul Craig. It was a stylistic matchup that was favored him. Muniz, you know, he gassed. It was just a matter of time. And um, yeah, I thought Malcoon won, to be honest. I had to watch that fight the other day for when Malcoon was fighting. And I felt he won that fight against Brendan Allen, to be honest. Um, you know something? Brendan actually said he got the mental – like, so he got a sports psychologist to start working with him. No, and no he shit. said – yeah, and he had uh, – right after the Malcoon fight. Because he said, like, even though I won that fight, I didn't feel good about it. He's like, I had a lot of things going on in my personal life and outside the cage. And he's like, and I felt like that was uh, affecting me in the cage. And he's like, so I started seeing a sports psychologist. I felt more dialed in since then. And then the interview that he gave at, at media day, he was like, listen, last time out, you know, he caught me, he got me. And he's like, hats off to him. He's like, but the reason I feel like it's a fluke is because I was losing my focus and I was paying attention to things outside the cage and I got clipped. I got hurt. Yeah. Dude, he was literally, dude, he was literally talking to Sean Strickland. He was literally talking to him during the fight. He's literally talking to Sean. And I was like, what, what are you doing? He was like so overconfident going into that fight. And I remember I had the ends KO and the Allen KO. I was like, well, one of these is dead. So give me the other, please. I think Chris <laughs> Curtis took him out. But I just think that in this fight, he understands, like I have skills that could beat Chris Curtis, but last time I fought like an asshole and I'm talking to people on the outside. The one other thing I'll mention is he said that he cleared up the beef with Sean Strickland. Cause I thought to myself at first, I was like, Sean's just going to be at the apex again. Like, fuck you dude. And like yelling into the cage, but that's not going to be the case. I think they're cool now. I think that him and Chris Curtis are cool as well. So I think it might be a little more respectful, a little bit more touch and go in the beginning, maybe not as uh, you know, right to business with the insane punching combinations. And if that's the case, I just like Brendan Allen, his distance tools, you know, Chris Curtis is pretty limited to, he's got a, a, you know, that one awesome hook kick to the face that I recirculated on Twitter this week. But otherwise, like he's mostly a guy that goes out there and boxes with heavy hands and looks to take you out with his counter punching. But he's also like putting shots off the guard and things like that. And when somebody's able to get free kicks off, they can target your body. They can target your head. They can come up the middle as well. All those things are kind of ways to negate that boxing shell. So just seems to me yeah. like a, a, a good fight, competitive fight, but I like Allen. He's a, a more youthful guy, and I just think he's big for this middleweight division. I think he's a lot more confident on top now as well. Beating a bunch of black belts in a row, I think that just gives him the confidence like, hey, 
you know, Chris Curtis may not be a guy that's easy to submit, but if I'm on top of you, it doesn't matter who you are. I can fucking submit anybody. And I think he, he does feel that way. I think he should feel that way. I thought he was going to submit Marvin Vittori, if I can just tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you can be betting Allen by sub anyway. It's a stupid number. Like, it's unbettable. So I, I don't mind well, Allen by KO, for- three, four, five. Um, but yeah, I guarantee Allen was the one to make up with Sean and, uh, you know, Allen DM them and be like, you know, be my friend, please, because uh, he's a he's a mental midget, and that's what they do, man. Bitch move, shouldn't have done it. <laughs> hey, fair enough. I I think it it all depends on the fighter. I think every fighter it ticks a little bit differently, and I think for Brendan Allen, when he's fighting emotional, it's a problem. When he goes out there and fights these other guys, where he doesn't have an emotional connection to the outcome, even in duress, even in the fire, like Bruno Silva knocks out twenty men in MMA. Right, he's a very dangerous guy with his hands. But Brendan Allen, when he started to wobble in that fight, he didn't lose focus. He didn't start running away like he did against Chris Curtis. He bit down on his mouthpiece, threw back, and knocked that guy's head off. So I just thought that that was a little bit of a sign of, like, this guy is starting to get what he needs to do. Uh, He's got to keep the respect. And a lot of these guys don't respect his striking, so they walk through it. And I think he's starting to do a lot more damage uh, and have more success in those phases. But maybe it's the quality of opposition. I do think that's a fair point. And uh, it's a great fight. But let's see if the mush of the week comes through. Let's see if the PFL prop of the week comes through. Um, I, I'm trying to think if I have a prop of the week for you guys. Um, you know, I, I'll say this. I can't even bet it myself right now because it's only on offshores. And I'm trying to wait for some other square books to open this up. But I think GDR ITD is an interesting look. And the reason I say that is just because – if you look at uh, Norma Dumont, she's been dropped by Carol Hosa. Oh, uh, and she's also been finished in the first round by Megan Anderson. I know that was a UFC debut, but that was not a great look in my view. So if we're getting a real version of Jermaine Duran to me and she does not look like a shell of herself, she has recorded first round knockouts, second round knockouts. She's a dangerous woman. And by the way, she choked out former champion Juliana Pena brutally with a guillotine choke the last time she was in the octagon. Everybody said she doesn't have grappling. No way she could outgrapple her. She got outgrappled for portions of that fight, exhausted Juliana Pena, beat her up with knees to the body. And when she ducked her head for one more bad takedown, she said, hey, hold this for a second. <laughs> Sleep. Thanks. And uh, that's just the, the MMA meta, as I've explained it many times, changes with the front headlock. It changes with the guillotine. You don't have to be the better grappler, guys. You just have to lock their head in a vice grip and they go to sleep like anybody else. That so, blew my mind, man. Pain is such a fucking head case. It, absolutely she is. But even you think of uh, the great Amanda Nunes, when she gets put in one bad compromised position, the choke's half in, she's already all the way out. It's like most of these people, when you finally get a tap, it's from somebody breaking mentally from all sorts of different things that could happen in the octagon. It doesn't always reflect like, Hey, you know, I, I have more stripes on my belt or I've been here to 10 more classes than you. It's like, can you go as hard as I can go for as long as I can go? And the physicality of Jermaine Durand to me, she's got five inches of reach. She's got, uh, you know, several inches of height, despite the fact that this other girl has to cut all the weight to make 135. So it's just like, for me, that, that suggests a little bit more of an athletic build. Um, for Jermaine Durand to me, but at 40 years of age, hey, how do, how do we see it going? Anybody's guess, but I just saw on Bet Online it was like plus 415 or something for Jermaine Durand to me, ITD, and that just seems a little bit wild to me given what we know about the fight. So shout out to Rich for the prop of the week. Shout out to you guys for all being here. God bless you all. Hope that you enjoy these fights. If you can, drop a like, get subscribed, and we'll see you next time and have all the same fun again. Rich, what do you got for the people anywhere else that they can find you, brother? Nothing. Get me on Twitter if you want to chat shit to me. DM. I love it. Peace, love, and chicken grease, guys. All my information's down in the description box below. The last thing I've got for you, fight numbers. If you're looking for a service for an odd screen to find these prop numbers, to be the first to know, Hey, check out fight numbers. The information's down in the description below. 50% off using code Liam. And they're good people over there. They'll hook you up. Um, Smart guys to work with as well. So God bless you all. Hope that you've enjoyed the content. Until next time, we'll see you for a better fight card. UFC 300 next week. A lot of surprises in store. Make sure you're there. Take care, everybody.